Alexis de Villar was a good friend of Salvador Dali, a famous Spanish artist, writer and a sculptor. Alexis even managed to capture beautiful moments of Salvador and his beloved wife. He sells the five photo series for 900,000 euros. Many of his artworks are published in magazines and museums all over the world. Alexis specializes in capturing life moments from different tribes in Africa, Asia and Morocco. He wants to transfer his values and beliefs to the whole world, promote equality and create peace. His photos are like alive, they are speaking to you, they are like a fragment of a movie that you can interpret and perceive in your own way, that you can imagine and feel. A process which started very young, when at 16 years old I left my house, and so I was a dishwasher, a busboy, waiter, I had no money, I had to go and sleep in the park. Mm -hmm. And one day, coming back from a long journey, I spent a month in the jungle. You know, when you are a creative person, you know, you tend to lose focus. And you don't do anything because exactly. there's too many things. <laughs> you have to focus. Religion is a personal thing. It's a personal thing. It's between you and your God. My job is to train myself not to be lazy, to wake up in the morning, to be there in front of the paper. So hello everyone, today we are uh, in art gallery in Puerto de Grande, uh, taking an interview with a famous photographer and writer Alexis de Villar. Uh, we're gonna have uh, conversations about art, philosophy and photography, so enjoy. Uh, so if you can tell us a bit about your art, your photographs, what uh, are you planning, what are you trying to transfer? with your photographs, with values? Well, to say the truth, uh, my art um, comes from a deep um, journey uh, in introspective, introspective journey of uh, not only traveling outside in the world, but also a process which started very young. When at 16 years old, I left my house to to become something else. Mm. My father used to have a big factory in Barcelona, Spain, and uh, I didn't want to to be uh, in the commercial world. So he didn't speak for, with me for many years <laughs> until his death when we make peace. But I left and I started living in London with uh, the son of Charlie Chaplin, Michael Chaplin. I was very lucky through common friends, they proposed me to go and live in London. And uh, when I reached there, I was surprised because the flat that I was introduced, very, very simple flat and very decaying in Hampstead, you know, Fisher Road. Uh, the person living there was uh, ex-wife, still wife, Patricia, who was a um, dramaturg, you know, uh, writing, playing, and very strange woman at night. Nice and two children, mm -hmm. and then Michael was there all the time, and he, and the flat was the flat of Michael Chaplin. Mm -hmm. So I was extremely privileged, thanks to him, to start photographing and meeting people like Peter O'Toole, and then Tom Bell, Jenny Agatha, uh, Michael Standy, who just made a film with Michael Caine, the Italian job in Rome, and then the Beatles, and Ozzy Clark, who was the best designer in London in Kensington High Street, uh, Biva, wow. Mary Kwan, and then all the Australians were against the system, between quotes, which was, was the swing in London, starting, and I was part of it, lucky, <laughs> very lucky, and uh, very young, I was only 16. And uh, these people from uh, Sydney, Peter, um, what's the name, uh, Martin Sharp, and Richard Neville started a magazine called Oz Magazine. And Oz Magazine was against the establishment. I mean, London at the time was still very classic. I mean, it's most men true. were walking in the street with uh, the bobby, I mean, the, the hat, black hat and the black umbrella, all dressed in black. And suddenly you will see incredible woman, and it was freezing death, with mini skirts. And uh, it was a revolution. And then the music and the uh, and the designing on the newspapers altogether changed it over overnight 
in less than one year, mm -hmm. it changed it and it became incredible, absolutely, and I was part of it. Wow. So this really changed me a lot. And uh, then I was very lucky also uh, because I moved to San Francisco when I was only 19. And then again in San Francisco, I met a guy called Lawrence Ferlinghetti, which passed away not long ago, very tall guy. And he was the publisher of City Lights Books in uh, next to uh, Columbus Avenue, who was the publisher of the Binnick generation. Alan Watts and uh, Henry Miller, Jack Kerouac, and, uh, and I was with all these people also at 19. I started to play ping pong at the time with Alan Watts in Sausalito. I shared there also a flat in Charlotte. And I couldn't afford to do other things. And so I was a dishwasher, a busboy, waiter. I even, for a month, I also was a taxi driver. So I know San Francisco very well. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes I was sleeping in a park. I had no money. I had to go and sleep in the park. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day it was very funny because I was invited to a private party on Russian Hill, very posh <laughs> place, <laughs> Russian Hill. And it was there someone from the press, from uh, this uh, San Francisco examiner, mm -hmm. who was from the Hertz publication. I mean, the daughter was the one later on cock into robbing a bank. So that, that was before that. And, uh, and then some people came to me and said, who are you? What are you doing in this party? And I said, well, I'm a writer and uh, try to make a film. And what is your name? And so for the first time and only one time in my life, I said, I'm Baron Alexis de Villa, which I'm not, <laughs> you know? But my grandfather was, only that my father didn't want to be, and me, I didn't want to be. My brother, who inherited, the, was supposed to inherit the title, didn't like it too. Mm -hmm. One of my sisters is still doing with this thing, and she's not entitled, but she's baroness. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it hit the news. It was in the, you know, in the, in the newspaper the next day or two days later. And since then, for a year and a half, everybody was inviting me even giving me a flat for free in Russian Hill. This is the keys, Alexis. You need anything else? We we'll send you food, da, 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 da. Oh and I was God. completely, just because suddenly, I, they were supposed I was a baron. You're lucky in yes. your life. <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> and uh, it reminds me of a famous film with um, James Stewart, fantastic film, where he gets a, a check of $1 million mm -hmm. and he cannot change it. Yes. And all through the film, he loses the check and then gets back the check. And the minute people think he has a check, he cannot change. So he's the same person, only with a piece of paper in, uh, in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they, they put him in the street again, like a closure, like, uh, you know, um, somebody's living in the street. Yes. And then suddenly they give you the best hotel room in the world, also because they think he's rich. Oh. But he's the same person all the time. It you know? shows the values of materialistic yeah. world, no? Yes. How do you uh, think about high education? I creativity? might be the, the, the worst person to ask this question, you know, because I was for much of my life against university. In fact, in my early curriculum, I was writing the University of Life. So, and also I was a dropout. At 16, I left school. I never Me came too. back. And I was in universities years much later mm -hmm. to teach photography as a, a guest, you know, what they call, um, you know, uh, independent courses of uh, place for shady people. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people uh, only thinking about a big car, I mean, a very expensive car, and then a very big house only with marble. So my question is how they hit, we have six months winter here, how they hit the marble in winter? Because you cannot live with marble. <laughs> you need wood. You need I a want to have a marble <laughs> in my house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Um, but what do you understand by time? It's a very scarce uh, commodity these days, especially I'm 75. Yes. So I have very few time. You know, the life expectancy in the Western world is 72 years old. So I'm already 
out of three years. Mm -hmm. So every second is a gift. And mm -hmm. I take it like this. For sure. That's why you learn. And I made many, many mistakes in my life. I think we always, we always say, somebody said, the devil doesn't know a lot because he's a devil, mm -hmm. but because he's old. Mm. So when you have less time to live, you think about the past. I mean, past can be very useless, but at least has one quality. You learn from your own past, you know? And uh, like everybody else, I made a lot of mistakes. So if I had to live again, I will use my time more properly. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, you learn to... I was reading about a very old man the other day, a video interview with a very old man, very famous, I won't say the name. And he said about this same question, you learn about doing only what matters more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Which priorities. Is like taking care of your children, taking care of you. You never, somebody lives with you if you, have, you are lucky enough to live some, share your life with someone, you know? Mm -hmm. And you learn about only seeing the people, not because they are rich, because not many people think what matters most might be only surrounded by people who kind of bring you money or success or whatever. No, no, it's not that. Mm -hmm. But to spend time with the people who are meaningful. Yes. It can be someone in the street. You know, that's why I say the best uh, company is a dog, or the best friend is someone you can look in the same direction. Maybe he not only comes to sit next to you, and you even talk each other. You know each other for so long, mm -hmm. you don't even need to talk. But sharing one life with this guy, and just looking at the people, he, he will go away, or girlfriend, you know, and uh, you feel you spend a meaningful afternoon, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then you have so many people who might be very successful and very rich, but they don't bring you anything meaningful, you know? So you learn with age to choose or, you know, and that's very important what I'm going to say, well, at least for me, is that you learn to be with yourself. I mean, if you don't, at a certain age, if you don't become your best friend, you are not successful in life. Mm -hmm. And how you can become your friend if your friend has nothing to tell you? So that's why I think we all have an alter ego in ourselves, yes. like a double person inside ourselves. This one, you need to enrich him with theater, with opera, with the dancing, with uh, art galleries, mm -hmm. with culture, with books, so that when you become old, you have someone to talk which is yourself, but yeah. it's your alter ego. <laughs> if you have empty, you have nothing there, you, you are about to commit suicide. Like many rich people in Hollywood committed suicide. And many people around the world at a certain mm -hmm. time, just because they feel sick or they feel suddenly my girlfriend is leaving me, oh, I'm alone, I'm alone. I don't think the problem is being alone. Mm -hmm. And they commit the suicide because they didn't take care of that. They didn't fit mm -hmm. that other person inside themselves, yes. you know? I agree. Like, I don't know, this I would say because I didn't like him, but you know, Gunther Sachs, he was a very famous uh, millionaire, millionaire. He married Brigitte mm -hmm. Bardot, uh, one of the marriage oh. to Brigitte Bardot. Yes. And this guy, when he became sick and spent yeah, already time at hospitals, you know, doing tests and things like this, he just committed suicide. And he was, I think, 60 years old, less. So maybe he could have lived, 30 years more, mm. but he had not fit that alter ego of himself. So he will have company until you die. Of course. I have children, and I was, when my daughter was younger, I was telling, you know, be careful with men. And he was, you know, everybody, fathers and mothers around the world, they want their, seats, their children to have other children, so you have grandchildren. And I say, be careful, because you're a photographer, and she's very good mm -hmm. photographer and painter, a sculptor, you know, that to leave everything you do because a man comes in your life. No, it's okay. wrong. Because that man might be killed one day by a car accident or just leave you for a younger woman or whatever. And what are you going to do then? You are what you are. And besides that, you love someone mm -hmm. and you share 
a house with someone, and you make children with someone, but it's only part of your, of your life. You have your own richness inside yourself, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not a problem if you don't never make children. You know, there are too many people already in the world. You are meant not to have children. It's no problem, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you say is the most important thing to do in life before you're gone? What is the most important thing? To, yeah, to live after yourself before you're gone. Well, for me, because you are interviewing me, uh, it's personal creation. Yes. It's my creation. Mm -hmm. Besides the family life and besides the friendship life, which is part of it, very important too. I mean, the sleeping is eight hours a day, so it's one third of the existence we lose already. Yes. All we invest in, in the sleeping. So the quality of sleeping is important. That's why the best investment you can do when you're broke is it's to sweet. buy a good bed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because one third of your life you're going to spend there, so it needs quality time. Yes. Even if you have nothing else in your flat and you stay in the in the floor because you cannot afford a canapé or a couch, you know, yeah, but the yeah. bed is very important. Mm -hmm. And now to answer this thing, one day, many years ago, I was with United Nations UNICEF working for them in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I think, 24 years old, 19, or 25, 1970, 1973, and 1974, so 25 years, something like this. And uh, I had given to me, because I was the director of Sri Lanka for uh, director between quotes, they told me, you take care of this, which was the photography in Sri Lanka. And I had already my driver and a minibus, Volkswagen, with, um, with the logo of UNICEF. Mm -hmm. And one day, coming back from a long journey, I spent a month in the jungle with uh, UNICEF of our children, so going and walking, and it was very, I was really privileged because after three days of walking, crossing rivers in this kind of bridges make of jungle, mm -hmm. you know, very impressive. I would come to a village and I was the only Western there. So they were expecting the United Nations to visit there and I represented the United Nations, but I was alone. Yeah. So they would stage a dance and children would be divided between girls and boys. And for two hours, they were dancing for me and I was only 25. So this experience, like another one, I discovered, I was introduced to a tribe, and from that moment, it became my big interest on tribal life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to wait also for a full day in a kind of, um, you know, hut for these guys to come for me. And they told them, somebody uh, wants to talk to you. So they came walking. Mm -hmm. And when this guy came, a small guy called Lauda, the tribe was the oldest at the time in the world because they were still very primitive and only on the stone age. They didn't know agriculture. They were just hunting and, uh, and picking fruits from the trees. That was huge. And they were very healthy. So when this guy came to me, I didn't talk to him, I didn't talk either. He came to me about a meter and suddenly he put the arms up like this and I followed him. I did the same. And then he took his hands with me and he smiled. And after that, he took me by hand, mm -hmm. like he knew me for ages, yeah. like a friend. And I went to live with them for three days. Wow. And in certain times, because I was there for a year, you know, I came back to visit them all the time. These this, uh, are called the Bedas, mm -hmm. and the missing link between the Bedics in Asia yeah. and the Western world. There are very few left yet, but you don't know anymore where they are, you know, yeah. because there are very few. Mm -hmm. And the new society in Sri Lanka, a modern society now, they are a bit ashamed of having still the people trial. in a stone age mm -hmm. in the place. But anyway, to come back about the question, one day I was coming back to Colombo, and at the time, my best friend there was Arthur C. Clarke. I was very lucky as well. I don't remember how I met him, mm -hmm. but the thing is, uh, I was all the time at his house playing ping pong with him every afternoon. This guy was famous, very famous at the time. And we were before the computers were, because mm -hmm. it was 73, there was no computers yes. in the world. 
This guy in the first floor, he had a computer as big like 100 square meters because it was given to him by NASA and he was a scientist from the NASA. Cool. So now any small laptop, even your phone, will be faster than that 100 <laughs> square meters. But anyway, this guy, Arthur Seclar, uh, was a very famous scientist and writer of science fiction. One of his books was The Sentinel. And out of Sentinel, he, one of his friends, Stanley Kubrick, made the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. So I was playing ping pong with this guy who was a luminary. And it was there another guy called Abraham T. Cobor, which I still remember, who has founded the Bertrand Russell Rationalist Society, mm -hmm. which was atheist. Like you say, you don't need a religion to be good or bad. No. Your reason will tell you. If you kill someone, they will tell you that is bad. Yes. So you don't need a religion. Religions are um, a supplement of contact with this uh, thing we, we, we name God, which is not anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic is that many religions around the world, they think God has the shape of a man. Anthropomorphic. Mm -hmm. Morphic. Yeah. So morphic is form. Anthropos in Old Greek is man. Yes. God, it does not have the shape of a man. It's energy and it's inside us. All living things are part of it, energy. But in our religions from the past, they made like it is a human who forgives, who punishes you. Nothing to do with this. Anyway, it was very interesting people at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a guy completely drunk and we were having dinner, and he started almost very pushy, telling me, Alexis, personal creation only. And he repeated 20 times. So I said, what is he saying? You know, because he knew I was direct, uh, I was working with uh, the United Nations. So he was meaning, it took me a few years to understand when I was becoming older. He meant, whatever you do, because you are, an artist, he thought, you know, mm -hmm. don't lose time with other things. Just take care of what, what you know and your talent. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I'm learning all the time. And, you know, when you are a creative person, you know, you tend to lose focus. Yes. <laughs> like, I'm going to do an, a shop, I'm going to do interior designing, I'm going to do architecture. Yes, for And sure. then you don't do anything because exactly. it's too many things. Yeah. You have to focus. You know, this for, is my if you problem. are a writer, just write. If you are a photographer, just make photography. You can do maybe two things if they are a bit related. Like, you know, if you are in the film, in the film industry, you can be a writer of films and then uh, slowly, one day you become the director of your film. Mm -hmm. And one day, if you are rich enough, you become the own producer. But it's all related to film. Yeah. You know, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned religion, and it's a very interesting topic for me. Religion. Religion, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have something you believe in, like particular? No, 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 no. I have nothing to do. Or... I was born a Christian. Yes. And I left for school at 16. And, uh, and I'm not going to talk here against uh, Christianity, because, you know, I have to respect uh, what other people feel. If I'm with a girlfriend, it happened in my life, which is a Muslim, for example, and after a month or six months, they want me to marry her. And I say, well, maybe, but you have to become Muslim. I say, look, religion is a personal thing. It's a personal thing. It's between you and your God, you know? So let everybody have his own God or no God at all. I like, uh, it's a country I like a lot, which in West Africa is Senegal. Because in Senegal, someone can be a Muslim and the wife might be Christian or opposite. And then the children, they choose what they want to be. And I think this is what it should be around the world, yes. you know? And will we have less problems like the present war in uh, mm -hmm. Gaza, Israel, you know? Exactly. Let people just flow and, you know, and believe in one God or not God at all, you know? Yes. But, you know, just uh, to, to get a bit deeper on the question, it's that all religions were born 
thousands of years ago, when we had no phone, no electricity, no nothing, and people, I mean the common folk, will maybe not understand why this river is getting out of the river, why now is coming a plaque of, uh, you know, called uh, small things, and suddenly everything becomes black. So at the time, that was the beginning of the priest. Mm -hmm. Priests were interpreting these signs like coming from God. extra, you yes, know, from God, yes, yes. for the people to understand. Mm -hmm. And of course, it might be some exceptions, but I don't think they were. The priests become very powerful because they had the key to understand these signs. Mm -hmm. And at the time when there was no money, people would bring them eggs, fruits, salad, vegetables. So the guy was becoming richer and richer. Even if you had no children and you had a piece of land, I will give it to the priest. Yeah, no, and that's for thousands of years, religions become very powerful. Mm -hmm. In fact, talking about the Christianity, and, uh, and Christianity was, I wouldn't say powerful, but it was resilient at the time of Rome, mm -hmm. you know, after Jesus Christ, uh, maybe even 500 years later. And the uh, emperor of Rome, they saw, I mean, the that the more they were killing them, you know, with the gladiators putting them and lions and lions will eat them in front of everybody, the more they were stronger. Mm -hmm. So then it came a guy called Constantine, yeah. Emperor. They said, if I cannot win them, I'm going to become Christian. And since that moment, and since that moment, Christianity has been very rich and powerful mm -hmm. because they associated yeah. with the power, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and this process is also happening, and I won't say names, of uh, countries. When a country makes a religion, the state religion, I mean, it becomes fundamentalist, fundamentalist mm -hmm. and freedom is not there anymore. Yeah. Because if you live there and you are not Islamic, in you an Islamic a state, you have a big problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they should not mix the state with the religion. Yeah, you know? I agree. I think that's a key, important okay. thing for the future of the planet, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you believe in uh, a higher purpose? Like, let's say, you know, karma, reincarnation? Well, I believe in karma and I believe in things that are set for us before, that for sure, that there is another reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an artist or as an author, I will tell you something which is important. I think, well, not important, but essential. Mm -hmm. When you're writing, I'm not writing. My job is to train myself not to be lazy, to wake up in the morning, to be there in front of the paper. I mean, Picasso was saying, in a way, was saying, let uh, the, so the inspiration mm -hmm. find me at work. Yes. So if I'm in bed, it will not come. It will be at work. And then maybe after an hour it comes. Anyway, for me as a writer, I had the experience, and the photography is the same, that if I'm trained into getting back into writing, and I know maybe the title of something because I have an idea, and some characters, the first few days or weeks or months are extremely hard mm -hmm. because I'm still writing myself. Yeah. It's only after gets into it that one day when you less expect it, suddenly I don't writing anymore. Mm -hmm. The pen moves and it's something coming much stronger than me yeah. through me is writing because maybe a character I was expecting to have half a page suddenly it takes three chapters and I go, what's <laughs> happening? You know? Yes. And this can be applied to any art uh, field. Yeah. Which, for example, if you are a dancer and you think you are the dancer, you will become mm. arrogant and your dance will be okay. I mean, from an academic point, it might be perfect, but it will lack the soul. Yes. The same yes. can be to a pianist or whoever. If you are a good dancer, you are supposed to be trained, mm -hmm. make a lot of exercise so your body is perfect, don't get into drugs, don't... don't uh, get into drinking mm -hmm. because you, your body has to be there. So when something else comes through you and you are just a tool, 
I believe we are just tools. Yeah. And uh, you will see that very well into, um, into actors. For example, I won't say names either, but if you're a famous actor in Hollywood, as an actor, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. You're just making mission or whatever, number three, number five, and they pay you a fortune. But as an actor, you're nothing. An actor, a good actor, disappears. He's not important. His name is not important. Mm -hmm. What you've done before is not important. You become the character. Yeah. And the only good actors are the ones you are watching a film and say, wow, this guy is incredible. But it looks like this actor, Lawrence Olivier, is, is him, because you, he's such a character and uh, yeah, yeah. what he's doing, that you're even, you cannot even think it's him, yeah. you know? And that's a good actor. Yeah. So you have, as an author and as a pianist or painter, you know, if you're a writer and you think only about money when you write, you're going to make maybe a bestseller, mm -hmm. but the writing will be ho horrible. Yes. So it divides in two, in two aspects. When you do a painting or you do writing or you do photography, you don't think about money. Mm -hmm. You think about doing what you have to do and in the best possible way. Yeah. Making money maybe comes, if you have that talent as well of marketing or selling, it becomes like it was not your book anymore. Mm -hmm. And then it's the time to distribution, to marketing, to book signing, to give hands to people who wants to know you personally, like yeah. today you are interviewing me for mm -hmm. a podcast. But this has nothing of the process of creating the, the work. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different process. Yeah. You know? Of course. And, and this, is, I think, is sacred in that way. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, and if you are lucky in life, to pursue, because that's also important. You know, when we are children, and we have destroyed that in, uh, in our children, is that parents, family, try to make that children successful in business. Mm -hmm. And we are all something. When you are a child, you are dreaming, becoming a dancer, becoming a painter, becoming whatever. Yeah. And then society and a school, that's why, to go back to your university, destroys that Potential. That's why I'm not going to university. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that's uh, that's essential to protect yourself from the system. And the system, uh, the pervading system, is every day more dangerous. And that's why the planet Earth is uh, in its the brink of collapse. And mm -hmm. we have killed most of our wildlife. You know, yeah. because. The whole world is in trying to produce things and create and not create, but into produce money, into produce mm -hmm. factories and things. Mm -hmm. Someone said, I mean, it will be better for the for the planet if you will be doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, COVID was very healthy for the wildlife. Yeah. During the three years of COVID, the rivers were more clean yes. and the animals were oh, they are not <laughs> people coming. You know, so. Yeah. We have to think this way. Mm -hmm, of course. <laughs> huh? What advice yeah. would you give young generation? Oh, that's a very tough advice. question, you know, <laughs> and it's very responsible. But I would say, in short, be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. What you have inside your inner, it's unique. Everybody is unique. Wherever you are poor or rich family, whatever you are member, maybe you have only one leg, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What you have inside you is unique. Yes. Even people say she's ugly. You're ugly. You are not ugly. You are unique. So keep that uniqueness, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Keep faith to that unique. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I think that's, that's it. Thank yeah, thanks to you too. It's been we... a pleasure. Yes. Me too. Really, but I didn't expect that difficult questions, huh? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I love philosophy, religion. Yeah. It's my thing, you know. I no, they were very, they very, very meaningful. And just to cut, can I say something else? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, people say, many people say, how are you with all this mind and what you think in living a place like Soto Grande? Mm -hmm. And I would say we are all in a standby. Mm -hmm. It's not forever. I'm here because I'm a political exile. 
Okay. Yes, you are a political scientist. Yes, I am. Okay. Because I left Catalonia where I had a gallery, I had a house, mm -hmm. and I had no mortgages. Everything belongs to me. I inherited part of it, you know, and my responsibility was to keep it financially healthy. And I lost everything. Here I'm only renting. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't live in a place was in the verge of becoming fundamentalist in the sense of nationality. Mm. Like, you know, they mix something which is very important. They mix a culture with politics. And a good sample, I lived part of the year in Kenya. You know, in Kenya, not every tribe, and we have 49, wants to become a country. I mean, Maasai's don't make the country of Maasai or Samburu mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, uh, Meru or uh, Digo in the coast or, you know, there are many tribes, Pokot, Rendile, uh, Samburu, uh, I said this one, uh, you know, Kikuyu. No, they were intelligent enough mm -hmm. almost 100 years ago, Omo Kenyatta made the independence of Kenya and then a teacher in Tanzania called Julius Nyerere, to say, no, every tribe keeps his culture and his language. But we are going to create a language which is going to be a vehicle for all the country, mm -hmm. which is the Swahili and the English. The English they inherited from the colonial. Mm -hmm. But the Swahili is the local one. Because the human, and that's related to education as well, the children are powerful. The brain of a child is powerful. He can speak five languages, mm -hmm. ten languages, if it's a mother language. You can make the experiment in your house if you have children one day or you have children now. Mm -hmm. If the child, two, three years old, already even younger, you give someone, the maid speaking in Swahili, the mother in French, the father in German, but don't mix them, otherwise he will mix up. Mm -hmm. So ten different people telling them ten languages, two years later he will prefer all ten perfectly. So it means you can be Catalan, which it was my language. I was born in Catalonia, in Barcelona, mm -hmm. and you know have the culture there, and at the same time to be Spanish, and at the same time to be European, because Catalonia belongs to Spain, mm -hmm. Spain belongs to Europe, Europe belongs to the world. So I'm not from the planet Mars. I'm from the planet Earth, <laughs> and then you get the division. But you don't need to make look like France. They don't make a country of Normandy or Brittany yes. or Roussillon mm -hmm. or Languedoc or Provence. It will be 30 countries. It will be a total mess. Each one with a passport, each one with an army. Mm -hmm. That's not the direction of the world. Mm -hmm. The direction at this present moment, and we, live to, we need to live in the present, it's going to cancel countries, cancel armies, like already Finland has no army. Yeah. Because we have the NATO, we have already the army, so we don't need each country like Spain to stay with an army. I think that should be the direction. Exactly. Cancel it, it's a slow process, but cancel all the armies, you know, for the interior safeness, we have the police, we have the Guardia Civil, and this. And then you have an army to protect Europe. That's the direction. Mm -hmm. And we are not going to see it, but maybe in a hundred years, if we still live in this planet, which the planet is fed up with us, mm -hmm. and the human race still live here, it has not gone abroad, you know, maybe we'll have only one government around the world. People say, Alexis, this is wrong because everybody will be equal. No, 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 no. You still are in Normandy. You will eat maybe in Normandy things, or Provence, or kill this. Yeah. But this does have a government because we might be, we are in the, in the galaxy, and then we have people living in Mars, and in uh, the moon, in other places, you know, but we are from the planet Earth, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And this doesn't mean that you don't dance the, the flamenco if you're in Andalusia or you eat the things there. I mean, nothing to do with it. Don't make political what, the, like I was telling before on religion, don't make political what is not political. Mm -hmm. A language is just a language, okay. you know? Yeah. A dance is another dance. And that's why I left Catalonia. Why? Because they say Sardana, you have only two in the school of Catalan. No, sorry. Look at Holland. Children at the school, they speak Dutch, mm -hmm. they speak English, and many they, have, they choose another language like French because it's not France, or whatever, you know, or German, or, you know, uh, Portuguese. Yeah. And the children, when they are 10 years old, 15 years old, they speak three, four languages. Why not? 
I mean, this is richness of someone to learn all this language, to be able to communicate with other people. Mm -hmm. So the problem with Catalonia, and now we are in the brink this week and next week, because they want to give amnesty to the people who make a coup d'etat, I mean, you know, and uh, just to, to remain in power, the Socialist Party here, you know, and they are going to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the start of section in Spain, because if they give this to Catalonia, immediately they will ask for a referendum to become independent. Yeah. If the Catalonia becomes independent, the Basque, they want it, and they fight it for many years before the Catalans, and then the Baleares and the Canary Islands and Andalusia, and uh, we cannot have 10 countries here. Yeah, it's completely sure. stupid. It doesn't go in the direction of the world today, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's backwards, it's completely backwards. Mm -hmm. Don't make divisions, unite people. Yeah. That's the most important, okay. you know? Yeah. Thank so you. I finish with this. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks to you.